Well, thank you very much for your invitation to your university. And thank you, Professor Hiller, for inviting me to the Copernicus Institute. It's a great honor for me to be, for the first time in my life, in Krakow. I have heard many things about it. I have been many times in Poland, starting in 1976, but I never got to Krakow. So it's my great pleasure to be with you today. Our topic is, has science buried God? And I want to suggest to you that far from science burying God, science actually points towards God. And it is atheism that is burying science. Now, I know that's a very provocative statement, but it's late in the afternoon and you need provocative statements to keep you awake. So, let's look at the debate. The common thought is that you've got science here, and you've got belief in God here, and they are antipathetic. They do not belong together. That is far too simplistic. An easy example is the Nobel Prize for Physics. Last year, won by a Scotsman, Peter Higgs, for his prediction of the existence of the Higgs boson. Peter Higgs is an atheist. A few years ago, the same prize was won by William Phillips, an American. He is a Christian. Now, here's a very interesting situation, because they both won the Nobel Prize for Physics. That is, they are brilliant physicists. What divides them, therefore, is not their science. What divides them is their worldview. One is an atheist, and the other a theist, a Christian. And what I want to suggest to you is that the conflict is not between science and God. The conflict really is between two worldviews. For our purposes this evening, the worldview of atheism and the worldview of theism. And that worldview tension has existed for a very long time. If you go back to the ancient Greeks, and think of people like Democritus and Leucippus, who were the founders of the atomic theory. They were brilliant thinkers. They had the idea that ultimate reality consisted of two things. One, the atoms, and the other, empty space. And they sought to explain everything in terms of atoms and empty space. The atoms... Um, collided and they coalesced to form galaxies and so on and life arose, etc. They were the fathers of what we now call materialism. But at the same time, there were thinkers like my intellectual hero Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, who claimed that there was transcendence. There were the gods or there was God. There was something more than physics and chemistry, or mass energy. There was a transcendent creator. And in the academy today, we have exactly those two worldviews, particularly where I work at Oxford. We have brilliant scientists who are atheists, and we have brilliant scientists who are theists. And so the real question is not, are science and religion compatible or not? The real question is, which way does science point? Does it point towards atheism, as my colleague Richard Dawkins claims, or does it point towards theism? And I want to investigate the current debate and talk about a series of confusions. I call them intellectual fog. Now, when I arrived in Krakow today, there was fog. And as I look at this debate, I discover there is a lot of misunderstanding that hinders people from navigating what this debate is really about. 
Now, I am a pure mathematician. I will not be talking about logical proof because you only get that in logic and in pure mathematics. And even there, there are lots of questions. What I shall be talking about is evidence, pointers, indicators. Now, of course, that does not mean that I'm talking about something that's conceptually weak. For instance, I've been married for 46 years to the same woman. And I cannot prove to you mathematically that she loves me. But I would stake my life on it. I think the evidence is strong enough to have that commitment. So the fact that we do not possess absolute logical proof does not mean that we do not have evidence. Now, we are in a very famous city and in a very famous institute over which the name of Copernicus stands. A week ago, I was in the city of Johannes Kepler, although I believe he was also here. And as we look back on the history of science, the very interesting fact and it has interested me since I was very young, is that the founders of modern science, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, were all believers in God. Now that's a striking fact. Because when Joseph Needham, who was a neo-Marxist, tried to explain why it was that modern science did not arise in China. He spent many years trying to solve that problem on the basis of the assumption of Marxist principles, and he couldn't. And in the end he said, the real difference and the only difference I see between the East and the West is that the West lacked the unifying concept of a single creator who had created a universe to work according to fixed laws. In other words, there is a connection between the rise of modern science and belief in God. Now that's very striking to me. C.S. Lewis formulated it like this. He said, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Now this thesis is widely represented today. Alfred North Whitehead once said that modern science must come from the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. The impress on the, on the European mind arising from the unquestioned faith of centuries. So, Richard Dawkins, when I once debated this with him, he said, but, you know, there's nothing to that because either um, there is a God or there isn't. Everybody believed in God in the, in the Middle Ages. And so, of course, science arose in a culture that believed in God. And I reminded him that everybody is not contained in Western Europe, that he'd forgotten China. And I made the point that I've just made to you about Joseph Needham. Historians and philosophers of science generally agree that there's a deep connection between faith in God as the rational intelligence behind the universe and the rise of science. And of course there's a logic to that. Because every scientist believes to start with that science can be done. And one of the biggest evidences to me that there is a God behind the universe is the fact that science can be done. Now, I'm going to come to that in a little more detail later. But just simply at the level of history, there seems to be this very close connection. Now it's interesting because belief in God, far from hindering the rise of science, appears to have been the motor that drove it. Now, I want to make this more precise. I want to compare two figures, Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking. They have this in common, they're both brilliant. And secondly, Stephen Hawking 
and Isaac Newton held the same chair at Cambridge. So that's enough to make them very impressive figures. But now the interesting thing about them is that Newton discovered the law of gravitation. And for him, it was part of his reason for believing in God. Stephen Hawking takes the exact opposite view. For him, the law of gravity is the reason not to believe in God. Now, I find that very interesting. And so, I want to formulate my talk tonight by asking the question, what has happened between Newton and Hawking? And why is there this difference? Why does the discoverer of the law of gravity believe in God? And Stephen Hawking, who is arguably the a best known scientist alive and is brilliant, why does he say the law of gravity leads him not to believe in God? I'm of course referring to the central argument of his book The Grand Design. He says because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And that's part of his main argument disproving the existence of God. So, what are the central issues here? Newton says God and science. Hawking says God or science. And as I travel around the world, and I've been in many countries in the last four months, many of our young people, students, are asking this question, why must I choose between God and science? Why does Hawking think we have to choose? Well, the first confusion, I think, is this. That Stephen Hawking and others are confused about the nature of God. The problem is not, first of all, scientific, although that's part of the problem. The problem starts with confusion about the nature of God. Now, I want to try and explain that. When I was young, I come from Ireland, which has many similarities to Poland. When I used the word God, most people would understand that I meant the eternal triune God of the Bible, who created the universe and who sustains it. That is no longer the case. You cannot assume that people understand what you mean by God. Has science buried God? Yes and no. Science has buried many gods. And here's an example. You see, what I've come to understand in the last few years is that many of my atheist friends think that I believe in a so-called God of the gaps. Now, what is a God of the gaps? Crudely put, it's, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Less crudely explained, I'm frightened of lightning, I postulate a god of lightning, and then I study atmospheric physics at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and the god of lightning disappears in lecture number one. That's the god of the gaps. And that kind of god is dispelled by science. Now, the logic of this, though, is very important. If you think of god in those terms as a god of the gaps, then you have to choose between science and God because that's the way you've defined God. If you define God to be the X that explains until you get a scientific explanation, then by definition you have to choose between science and God. And I believe that that is part of the fog intellectually that is surrounding this debate. People do not make clear what they mean by God. And so, for instance, as a scientist, if I'm offered the God of the gaps, well, I'd say, of course, I choose science and not the God of the gaps. But the God of the Bible is not a God of the gaps. He's the God of the whole show. That is, he created the bits we do understand and the bits we don't. Now, let me go back to Newton. You see, when Newton discovered his law of gravity, he did not say, I have a law of gravity, therefore I don't need God. What did he do? He wrote the Principia Mathematica, probably the most brilliant book in the history of science. 
and he expressed in it the hope that it would persuade thinking people to believe in God. In other words, the more he understood of the universe, the more he admired and believed in the God who did it that way. Now that corresponds to the way we normally think. The more you understand of engineering, the more you can admire a Rose or a Royce. The more you understand of art, the more you can admire the work of a Rembrandt, not the less. That's the usual way it is. And so the more I study and understand of the universe, the more I admire the God who did it that way because my faith is not in a God of the gaps, it's in the God of the whole show. So God is the God of the things I do understand and of the things I do not understand. Now let me repeat, I think this logic is very important because I've talked to many people and eventually I discover that they think that I believe in a God of the gaps and therefore I am intellectually absurd because I ought to be choosing science instead of God. It's their false concept of God that leads to that false choice. Now, the next step which is linked to this is the nature of explanation. I find this an immensely important topic. What is an explanation? What is a scientific explanation? Is God the same kind of explanation as a scientific explanation? And of course Richard Dawkins has insisted that God's the same kind of explanation so that therefore it's either God or science. So let's investigate this just a little bit more. Why is the kettle boiling? Well, it's boiling because heat energy from a flame is being conducted through the base of the kettle and that's agitating the molecules of water and they're getting very violent in their vibration and the water is boiling. That's why it's boiling. Of course it's not. It's boiling because I want a cup of tea. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're laughing because it shows, you see, that's an absurd statement. To say, no, it's not. It's boiling because I want a cup of tea. Because what you're confronting there are two different levels of explanation. One is a scientific explanation, and the other is an explanation in terms of personal desire, personal agency, or personal intention. And it's totally obvious that those two explanations do not conflict, they do not compete, they complement one another. Now that's a very simple illustration. But I find that such is the reach of scientism. That is the idea that science is the only way to truth. That many scientists I talk to do not see that there's more than one level of explanation. Let me put it this way. The claim that God created the universe no more conflicts with science than the claim that Henry Ford invented the motor car conflicts with the law of internal combustion. If I offered you two explanations of the motor car, one was automobile engineering and the law of internal combustion on the one hand and Henry Ford on the other and say choose, you'd say don't be silly, you need both. Why cannot some very high-powered scientist not see that difference? That explanation comes at different levels. There's scientific explanation and there's explanation in terms of agency. Let me repeat God is not the same kind of explanation as science. One of my colleagues at Oxford is Richard Swinburne, and he once uh, said, he said, science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. Now that's a little bit deeper, and it's something that I want to come to in a moment. But first of all, the major objection 
you've probably heard of the book The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins. Now that's a very interesting book because one of the key arguments is this, that if you postulate God as creator of the universe, then you must logically ask who created God. You've heard that argument, I suspect. And then it comes, who created the creator that created the creator that created the creator, and so on, ad nauseam, ad absurdum, forget God, this is nonsense. I was staggered when I found that argument in his book. Because simple logical analysis shows the following. If you abstract one level up, who or what created X? That question has an inbuilt assumption that's not stated, but it's obvious. The assumption is that X was created. Who or what created X assumes X is created. What if X was not created? Then the question does not apply, full stop. And you see, here's the interesting thing. Dawkins thinks he's abolished God by asking this question when his question only applies to created gods. And we don't have to think very hard before we know that it doesn't take science to abolish created gods. We all know that they are uh, nonsense because we usually call them idols. The central claim of the Bible is that God is eternal. And we've just heard a fascinating lecture from Professor Heller on the concepts of time and eternity. And if there's something eternal, then of course to ask who created that is a contradiction in terms. So the question doesn't apply. And yet, interestingly enough, it does apply to created gods. So I asked Richard Dawkins in my debate, you believe the universe created you. So let me ask you your question. Who created your creator? I'm still waiting for an answer. That was eight years ago. <laughs> you see, the question basically is, deeper at the philosophical level, it's a question about ultimate reality. Now, I find that on both sides of this debate, now I know there's another side, but for the purposes of this lecture, I have to stick to the two, atheism and theism, that on both sides, the questions stop. On the atheistic side, ultimate reality is what? Well, for some it's mass energy, for some it's a multiverse, but more popularly today, the ultimate reality is nothing, which is a very interesting intellectual stage to have reached. The ultimate reality is nothing. Listen to Hawking again. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. For the theist, like me, the ultimate reality is God. So what you've got is the very interesting intellectual situation today where you've God or nothing as the background to the existence of the universe. Now, we could talk a lot about that. In fact, I find myself giving lectures on the topic of nothing these days. It's a most interesting topic, I find, to lecture nothing. And you may want to ask something about that later. So ultimate reality, it's not a question of is there an ultimate reality. The question is more which reality is ultimate. Now, let me say something again about the logic of Hawking's explanation. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And when I read that first, I thought, just a moment, because there is a law of gravity, because there's something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. But that's a flat contradiction. And then I thought more, because there is a law of gravity, he doesn't say because gravity exists. But what would a law of gravity mean if there's nothing to describe it? And that opens a window into another fog to my mind as to the status of the laws of nature. 
Newton's laws of motion never caused anything to move in the history of the universe. Newton's laws of motion describe motion. A billiard ball on a table is not caused to move by Newton's laws, it's caused to move by someone with a cue. And Newton's laws will describe it to a certain extent. And this idea that laws create something is a very strange one. And of course we're all familiar with it. Um, I once had a conversation with Peter Atkins, who's a very famous atheist physical chemist in Oxford, and I asked him, what do you think created the universe? And he said, mathematics. <laughs> and I'm afraid I started to laugh. I, I just spontaneously laughed. He said, why are you laughing? Well, I said, Peter, I am a mathematician. And I said, look, one plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? <laughs> and I added, I said, you know, the financial crisis, what caused it? Some people thought that mathematics could create money. Do you remember that crisis? We're all victims of the belief that mathematics can create money. And of course it cannot. C.S. Lewis said in the 1940s in some of his brilliant writings, you can do mathematics from now to eternity. If you've got one pound and you've got another pound, that'll give you two pounds. But unless you've got one pound, mathematics will never give it to you. There's a confusion as to the status of law. And it's very interesting in Hawking's book, because there is a law of gravity, he thinks, he seems to, that the law of gravity is causative and creative. The very first example of a law in his book is the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But that law, that regularity, doesn't create the sun, nor the east, nor the west. It's a description of what happens in the universe out there. So it seems to me that there's intellectual confusion at the philosophical level as to the status of the laws. It's even worse than that, it seems to me. Come to that statement again. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself. If I say to you, X creates Y, what does that mean? Well, roughly speaking, it means, doesn't it, if you've got X, you'll get Y. If I say to you, X creates X, what does that mean? Well, it seems to me to mean that nonsense remains nonsense, even if very clever scientists are writing it. It's absurd. This idea of a creation of a universe out of nothing has led to some of the most absurd statements I've ever read. Let me quote you a very well-known astrophysicist. Now, what do you think of this statement? Because nothing is physical, sorry, because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. What? Because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. But that is nonsense. And that's Lawrence Krauss. And what concerns me about this is, he writes a book claiming to get a universe from nothing. He's done no such thing. What he's done is to redefine nothing. Now that's a very interesting exercise. I mean, most of us know what nothing is. If I say I went into the Great Square in Krakow, and I met nobody, it doesn't mean I met somebody called nobody, it means I didn't meet anybody. Nothing. And I had the opportunity, we saw a picture in the earlier lecture of the theory of inflation. The idea that just after the Big Bang there was a period of something like 380,000 years where there was a very sudden inflation of the universe. That theory was thought of by Alan Guth at MIT. And I had a public debate with him on these topics a couple of years ago. And I thought it was a very good opportunity to ask him this question. I said, Alan, out there in the public, there's a big confusion about nothing. I said, when you use the word nothing, you do not mean 
nothing in the ordinary philosophical sense of the word. That is absence of any kind of substance. And he said, of course we don't. A quantum vacuum is not nothing. I said, thank you very much. There is confusion about nothing. Because, of course, the idea that space-time had a beginning, which some question, as we heard earlier, forces people to try to answer Leibniz's question, why is there something rather than nothing? Now, of course, from my perspective, the answer to it, in one sense, is very clear. There is a universe because God caused it to be. God is not nothing, but he's not something physical. God is spirit. But if you reject the existence of God, then you have a massive problem. You've got to get something from nothing. And you've got nothing to do it with. So you redefine nothing. So it's worth watching just what's going on in the generation of these arguments. Now, let's come again to explanation. Science explains. Now, I've already pointed out there are different levels of explanation. But another thing is important, and it's this. The law of gravity, what does it explain? Well, when I was taught it first at school, I thought it explained gravity. But that's what it doesn't explain. Nobody knows what gravity is. What the law of gravity does is giving you a means of calculating gravitational effects, and it's brilliant, of course. It will enable you to land a person on the moon, even without Einstein's um, refinements. But as Newton himself realized, it doesn't tell you what gravity is. Richard Feynman, who was mentioned earlier, once said, let no one deceive you. No one knows what energy is. No one knows what gravity is. You see, when we say science explains, many people today think that's it. It's an exhaustive explanation. What I'm suggesting to you is not only is it not an exhaustive explanation in terms of different categories, it's not even an exhaustive explanation within science itself. And therefore, it's very important for us to be humble as scientists about how little we know. The law of gravity is magnificent. I would love to have discovered it. But I didn't. Newton did. It's brilliant, but it doesn't tell you what gravity is. And so the kind of statement I often hear is that we've got a scientific explanation, though we, therefore we don't need God, is false at several distinct levels. And that's very important to realize. Now, I have two loves in life. Well, I have a number, including my wife, of course. But let's leave her out. I've loved languages since I was a young man. And I've loved mathematics. I, I am embarrassed. That's such a pity, really. I should have learned it. I've been in your country many times. And I'm embarrassed that I don't speak it. I speak several other languages, though. Because pure mathematics is at one end of a spectrum of language. It is the most elegant language, is it? Kepler once said, didn't he? that the object of investigating the external world is to study it in the language of mathematics that God has given us. Human languages, on the other hand, are what we use to communicate. Now, I see three major things here. Firstly, that we are language producers. Secondly, that in the database that forms our DNA, there's a text at the heart of our existence biologically. Thirdly, we are capable to a certain extent of understanding the universe in the language of mathematics. That's astonishing. Einstein was clever enough to realize there was a problem. And you will recall that he wrote the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And Eugen Wigner, the Nobel Prize for Physics, like Einstein, 
wrote a very famous article that mathematicians all love or hate in 1961 called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Here's a mathematician and she's thinking in here. And she comes up with a series of equations that somehow apply to the universe out there. How does that work? How does abstract series of symbols and concepts in here link into the universe out there? And Wigner said it's unreasonable. Well, now that's interesting. Is it unreasonable? Well, it depends on your worldview. Now, let me explore that a little bit. Because I would want to argue that for me, the biggest pointer to the existence of God is language at all of its levels. The DNA language, the fact that we can speak in languages and that we're rational beings, and the fact that we can tame the universe to a certain extent with mathematics. Now, why do I think that? Well, actually, it goes back to a very simple consideration that now has become quite important in philosophy. Let me start with illustrating it very simply. I sometimes ask my colleagues in Oxford, what do you do science with? And they say, what do you mean? I mean, I've just been given a million pounds and I've got this wonderful collider and all this. I said, no, I don't mean this, I mean this. Oh, I see. You mean my, and they're about to say mind when they think a little bit more, and they say brain. Because many of them do not believe there's any distinction between mind and brain. I say, okay, let, tell me about your brain that you do science with. What is your brain? And they say, do you want the long story? I say, no, I want the short story. What's the short story about the brain? Well, many of them say something like this. The brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And then I ask the obvious question, why do you trust it? I mean, if you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, you'd never trust it, would you? Now, that's not my argument. It's Darwin's argument. That's the interesting thing. Let me read you Darwin. With me, he wrote, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Now this is fascinating because over time, it's been picked up by several philosophers, and now there has been consternation in cyberspace because of something that's been written by one of America's leading philosophers. I'll come to that in a moment. Let me give you an example of some atheist comments on this. And it's important that these people are atheists. John Gray, modern humanism, he writes, is the faith that through science, humankind can know the truth and so be free. But, now this is him writing, not me, this is him writing. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Alvin Plantinga is a very distinguished philosopher. He's a Christian. If Dawkins is right, he writes, that we are the product of mindless, unguided, natural processes. Then, he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. Now listen to this. This is a very interesting statement. Dawkins' biology, on the one hand, and his belief in naturalism, on the other hand, would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. 
But the philosopher that's really stirred it up is Thomas Nagel. He's written a book with a very innocent title, but a very provocative subtitle. The title is Mind and Cosmos. The subtitle is why the neo-Darwinian view of the universe is almost certainly false. What? Now, this is very interesting because his argument goes like this. And C.S. Lewis saw this in the 1940s. Lewis said something roughly like this. We have done brilliant science by thinking about the universe, but we haven't thought about the process of thinking. And Nagel is now saying that we must bring the mind into the conversation. If we argue that science has got explanatory power, what about the mind that's doing the science? Now, that raises the fundamental question of reductionism. Is the mind reducible to physics and chemistry or not. Well, let me read Nagel again. He says this. Now this is a man who's a very strong atheist. He writes, I do not want there to be a God. So there's no religious bias in this statement here. And what it is, is this. If the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. And if you want to see the war that started because of that statement, just Google Nagel uh, and see what he has to say. Now, I'm coming to a conclusion in a moment because we're going to have time for questions. I want finally to come to another aspect of the nature of explanation. Now, we are taught often at school and university that the ideal explanation runs from the simple to the complex. And that that is always the case. Well, if you can get an explanation that runs from the simple to the complex, as you can in many fields of science, that's wonderful. But I think there's one area in which we know that that is false. That explanations can be more complex in one sense than the thing you're explaining. Richard Dawkins and I once had a little discussion about this. And he said, look, if you invoke God, in any sense as an explanation, that's nonsense because by definition, God is more complex than the thing you're explaining. So he's not an explanation. To which I answered this. I said, well, I said I have been reading a book recently called The God Delusion. It's quite complex. It's 400 pages long. So because of its complexity, I asked some questions about its origin. And somebody told me that it originated in the very much more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. But I rejected that explanation because the explanation is more complex than the thing you're explaining. <laughs> you see, ladies and gentlemen, where language is involved, we never argue downwards either to chance and necessity or to physics and chemistry. We always intuitively respond by saying, there's a mind behind this. Now, that intuition seems to me to be vastly important. You see, here's the irony of 21st century physics. We live in the information age. Now, I know I'm among philosophers of physics here, so I've got to be very careful. So I'll be extremely careful and say information is very difficult to define. We can discuss Shannon information, but semantic information is very difficult to define. But nevertheless, one thing I think is true is that information is not material. Now, I know that Rolf Landauer wrote a famous paper in physics saying information is physical, but a book has just appeared in Oxford pointing out that this is incorrect, this is a misunderstanding. What he meant was, apparently, 
that the carriers of information are physical, usually. But information itself is not material. Now here's the irony. Some people are telling us that this is a purely materialistic universe. And yet one of the fundamental things now in 21st century as we begin is that information is fundamental. And some people are suggesting that information is not reducible to physics and chemistry. Indeed, Anton Zeilinger, who was quoted earlier by Professor Heller, the quantum physicist in Vienna, wonders whether it may be the other way round, and that information is quantized. There are fascinating developments, but the basic point is this. Information is not material. Now, if that is the case, that is the end of materialism, as having sufficient power to explain. So, we've got two worldviews. One of them now starts with the particles, mass, energy, or nothing, and argues that explanation must always be bottom-up, because there's no top ultimately. The other explanation is the other way round. So I've got a few minutes left because you'll probably notice we started late. So let me tell you a little story to illustrate this. We have very pleasant dinners in our college. I wish you, I could invite you all uh, to them, but I can't. And uh, the only problem is that we can't sit where we want. So one night I found myself beside a very eminent biochemist. And he made the mistake of asking me what I did. I said, I'm a pure mathematician. Oh dear, he said, how boring. <laughs> well, that wasn't a very good start. <laughs> so I said, I know my subject is complex and unsociable, but actually I'm interested in other things. And he said, like what? Well, I said, for instance, I'm interested in the status of the universe. Is it created or not? Is it eternal or not? Is it the ultimate reality or not? Oh, he said, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he said, listen, I'm an atheist, I'm a reductionist, we've nothing to talk about, and we're going to have a very miserable dinner. <laughs> well, that was a challenge in the first five minutes of dinner. So I said, no, we're not. Not. We're going to have a most interesting dinner. He said, why? Well, I said, you're a reductionist. So am I. He said, are you? I said, yes, I know at least three kinds of reductionism. Which kind are you? I said, I mean, when I've got a big problem, I split it into little problems. I study the little problems and hope to gain insight on the big problems. That's methodological reductionism. He said, I do that too. Well, I said, we've got something in common now, haven't we? We can talk about it. But he said, I don't mean that. I said, I know you don't. You're an ontological reductionist. From the Greek word ontos, meaning being. You believe everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, that's right. So I said, well, why don't we do an experiment? He said, what? At the dinner table. I said, sure, this is Oxford. <laughs> so. He said, what's the experiment? Well, I said, um, why don't we look at the menu? So I picked it up, and it said, roast chicken. He said, that's roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, it says so. I said, what do you mean it says so? I mean, those are just signs on paper. And you say it's got meaning. He said, what's your problem? I said, I have no problem. But Here's my question. You're a reductionist. Yes. Everything in terms of physics and chemistry. Yes. Right, I said. You explain to me the semiotics of these letters, the way they carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was silence. And his wife was sitting beside him. And she said, perhaps a little too loudly, she said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but he didn't try. He said something that I've never forgotten. He said, you know, John, 
For 40 years, I've gone into my laboratory thinking that could be done. And I was so staggered. He said, it can't be done. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. So I said, physics and chemistry have only been going for six or seven hundred years. He said, it doesn't matter. Physics and chemistry don't have the explanatory power to deal with meaning and language. And he looked at me for a long time, and I suddenly, it dawned on me what he was thinking. You're not clever enough to have thought of that argument. He said, where did you get that argument? I said, it's okay. I got it from a Nobel Prize winner. Oh, he said, that's all right. <laughs> but you see, that's true, isn't it? But I pushed a little bit further. I said, roast chicken, R-O-A-S-T, five letters. And you deduce intelligence. Now, that menu might have been printed by automatic processes, by machines that are in themselves blind and automatic. But you know, at some level, intelligence was involved. He said, yes. I said, what do you study in your laboratory? He said, DNA. Oh, I said, why do you call the letters codons? Well, he said, because they code for something. Oh, I said, that's interesting. They have a semiotic dimension. He said, of course. I said, what's the origin of that ultimately? He said, chance and necessity. What? I said, you look at a five-letter word in English and you immediately infer that whatever natural processes or automatic processes have been involved, that there's a mind behind it. And you look at the longest word we've ever discovered, 13.5 billion letters, one letter for every year of the age of the universe. It's interesting, isn't it? No, no it's 3.5. It's the age of the Earth. 3.5 billion letters, and you say chance and necessity. I say, look, even if that's a black box, and you don't know anything about the physics and chemistry involved, what you can at least see is that text is involved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to suggest to you is this. One worldview starts with nothing or the multiverse or energy and says that mind is derivative from physics and chemistry, and the idea of God is derivative because there is no God. That's one view. The other view goes like this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through Him. And without Him, nothing came to be that came to be. Those are the two worldviews, now starkly put. One says that mass, energy, physics, and chemistry, wherever the laws came from, and that's a big question, is primary and mind is derivative. The other says mind is primary, the mind of God, and mass, energy is derivative. And what I face is the question, in light of science, which of those two views makes most sense? I know what my answer is. I wonder what yours is. Thank you very much indeed.